the prayer. Uh, if you'll bow with me, please. Uh, Father in heaven, we uh, come before you thanking you. Thanking you for all the blessings you've given us as individuals, as families, as a, as a church family. We cannot thank you enough for that. Thank you always for your son Jesus and the sacrifice that was made for us. Uh, please be with us and uh, please uh, um, let us our, our, our worship service be pleasing in your sight. Help it to be done decently and in order and pleasing in all aspects to you. Thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So this is our last class on the topic. As you all might remember, next week we start the uh, small groups. We start the small groups. So starting next week, we're going to break up into, I think, five, five different groups. And so we have to finish this lesson today. We have to finish the lesson today. So if I don't call on you, if I ask a question and five hands go up and I only answer one person, please have understanding. I still love you. It's just time management. It's just time management. I'm a, I'm a clock watcher. So I'm always looking at the, at the time. Um, so um, having said that, I do want to answer a question that I got from a few people last week. A few people asked a question and enough people asked the question that I decided I'm going to take five minutes out of this class to answer that question. But just be aware, we're just not going to have time to, to discuss it or ask questions about it because it's not even a part of this class, but we're still taking the opportunity to answer it. So, um, so hopefully, you know, uh, this is uh, beneficial for you all. And also, on top of that, I know that uh, Ali and I were talking yesterday, and he said, like, sometimes you'll see, like, a slide, and I'll have, like, maybe eight, you know, like, verses on there. But I don't have the actual scriptures i just have the verses and and you know that the yeah it's not ideal and you know he's he's you know he's like you know i, I wish it was all written out and i'm with him problem is is then i'd have eight slides for that one slide you know and so that's not really uh, practical but if you want to see if you want this for yourself so you can look up all the passages all you have to do is give me your email and i'll email it and you will have this exact presentation even with all my notes in it, you know, and so uh, telling me when to turn the page and whatnot. So, so you know, uh, feel free to do that. Also, remember, this is an overview class. This is an overview class. So if, you, if there's something I mentioned in the class and you want further study on it, then you'll either ask the elders or ask, you know, the uh, other um, people who teach the Bible classes, and we'll get to it. Or, you know, if you want something more immediate, let me know. I have a Bible library at home. I will get you that answer. I will email you that answer. And so, all right, let's move on. Um, so this question arose last week, Revelation 11, 15. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So the question arose concerning instruments in the book of Revelation, and how does that apply to our study today? Well, you know, th these are rhetorical questions for time management. When did the old law end? Well, it ended at the cross. It ended at the cross. When does the new law end? Anybody? That's right. When Jesus comes back, when the second coming of Jesus, we will not be in heaven and have to baptize people, for example. You know, uh, we will not be in heaven and be able to hold people accountable to the New Testament any more than the Jews were able to hold the first century Christians accountable to the old law. It's done with. It's gone. Well, when Jesus comes back, it's done with. It's gone, you know. So the question still comes up. Will there be instruments in heaven? Possibly. The book of Revelation mentions instruments in heaven, but they could also be symbolic. That's possible. Uh, after all, the book of Revelation is a book heavy, heavy in symbolism. Um, but does it matter? Does it matter? No, because whether there is or there isn't, you know, whether there is or there isn't, it has zero impact on worship in the Lord's church under the new law. Let's consider the symbolism. So here, can we see the symbolism? When reading Revelation, one must know the Old Testament very well because Revelation refers back to the Old Testament and its symbolism 
all the time. Uh, for example, you know, let's look at it, you know, uh, briefly. Divine uh, symbolisms of trumpets in the Old Testament. Divine presence in Revelation. Trumpets often signify the presence of God. The trumpet blast preceded God's appearance. War and victory. Trumpets were used in battle, representing God's power to grant victory, as seen in Jericho. Judgments and warnings. In prophetic books, the trumpet sounds as a warning of impending judgment. Celebration and freedom. The trumpet symbolizes liberation, restoration, and new beginnings. And call to worship, or call to assembly. Trumpets were also used to gather people, signifying unity in the call of action or worship. See, so that's the symbolism of trumpets in the Old Testament. Well, think about this. When the trumpet sounds and Jesus coming, is coming back, well, number one, the trumpet blast precedes God's appearance. Well, that's going to happen. Uh, we will have victory. We will have victory. We're in for victory, you know. But that's going to be judgment. All of those who have not been judged, that will be judgment. New beginnings. New beginnings in the gathering of his people, the gathering of his people. So we can see by the symbolism, you know, that about the trumpet blast when Jesus comes. You know, so will there be instruments in heaven? Possibly. I mean, possibly. The book of Revelation mentions instruments, but it could be simple, uh, symbolic. But uh, does it matter? No. Because whether or not there is or not, it has zero impact on the worship in the Lord's church under the new law. Um, all right, so now on with class. This lesson will identify the elements of worship in the church that Jesus built. I.e., the activities in which the early church engaged in their worship with some observations about their spiritual nature in contrast to Old Testament worship. Let's begin by noticing, wow, I had two number ones. I don't know how I did that. <laughs> Let's begin by noticing, all right, I'll start off swiping. They observed the Lord's Supper. In the first century church, they observed the Lord's Supper as commanded by the Lord and his apostles, weekly as commanded by divine example, a memorial feast instituted by Jesus himself, taught to the churches by the apostles. In this memorial, they remember the sinless body offered on the cross and the blood that's shed to provide forgiveness for their sins. So we see in the first century church, you know, they took the Lord's Supper. And hence, we take the Lord's Supper. You know, um, uh, Ali, I was mentioning, uh, you know, that, you know, like how you and I were talking yesterday about, about the uh, verses and wish we had them all written out, you know. And so, so uh, yes, please, anybody wants a, wants a copy of this lesson, let me know, or any other lesson I ever do. Um, whoops, did I make a, a repeat? Oh, I did. I'm sorry. I made two slides that are the same. But uh, let me, uh, let me uh, take this moment as I go through this. It's a note, note of caution to the men who serve. Make sure, make sure when you're doing the Lord's Supper, you leave time and communion for people to examine themselves as we are commanded to do. So, you know, uh, keep that in mind. All right. They met on the first day of the week. They met on Sundays. As described in Acts 27, one can infer from this passage that they were doing this every week, every week, as confirmed by even non-religious historians. Non-religious historians unanimously agree with this. They agree that the first century Christians met on the first day of every week and they took Lord's Supper every time they came together. So that, that's, not even, that's not even Christian historians. That's non-religious historians. Uh, other passages certainly indicate they were assembling regularly on the first day of the week. For example, 1 Corinthians 16. They 
They gave to meet certain needs. They gave to meet certain needs. The church was noted for its love for one another. We as a congregation need to be noted for our love for one another, right? As exemplified in the church at Jerusalem, such love went beyond those in the local congregation. Uh, Acts eleven twenty seven. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. You see, they took, they took care of each other. You know, we need to take care of each other. A weekly uh, collection was instituted to provide for the needs of the saints. Principles were taught to determine how much should give as he may prosper. Whatever is given with a willing mind, according to what one has. As he pur uh, purposes or plans in his heart. Whatever one can give cheerfully and not grudgingly or of necessity, keeping in mind the principle of sowing and reaping. Funds so collected were used to help needy Christians, including those who devoted their lives to preaching the gospel. Yes, it is scriptural to pay for our minister. You know, it is scriptural to pay for our minister. They listened to the word. They listened to the word. They were noted for their attention to the word. We need to be noted for our attention to the word. The church in Jerusalem continued steadfastly in the apostles' uh, doctrine. As ambassadors of Christ, the apostles' words were taken very seriously, as they should be. They therefore used their assemblies to hear God's word. As when Paul spoke at uh, Troas, or when letters from the apostles had been received. We actually had a Bible study on that uh, a few months ago. They offered prayers and songs. Prayers and songs. Prayers were offered in their assemblies, especially in times of trouble. Songs were sung when they came together using psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to speak to one another, using the same to teach and admonish one another. Such were the activities in which Christians engaged in the worship of the early church. Um, and so we saw, we saw, you know, they're, they're singing, they're praying, they're taking Lord's Supper, they're hearing God's word, you know, uh, they're having a contribution. You know, those are scriptural things. Those are scriptural things that must be done when we worship God here. And we do that. We do that. We strive to be the new, uh, the new, uh, new century church, the New uh, Testament church. Uh, oh, I apologize. I forgot to, to finish that last slide. Um, such were the activities in which Christians engaged in the worship of their church. But in what way was their worship any more spiritual than that seen in the Old Testament? Let's look at a few observations on this. Contrast the Lord's Supper with Old Testament sacrifices. So this is us you know, contrasting the New Testament and the Old Testament. The Old Testament required elaborate ritual in offering various sacrifices. If you just read the Old Law, you can see this. You know, that boy, the amount of hoops they had to jump for everything, you know, was so difficult, was so difficult, which, um, which they involved physical senses. You know, when you went to, you know, to do your, to uh, uh, give your sacrifice, I mean, can you imagine, they, they would say that they would, you know, uh, sacrifice, was it like 100,000 animals? I mean, can you imagine just, I mean, I just can't even picture it, but the sight, the sound, the smell, the touch, it was right there, you know? 
the supper, a memorial to Christ's sacrifice, involves the mind more than the senses. You know, it's the mind requiring meditation rather, you know, than much in the way of physical action. Involving a time for re uh, reflection, self-examination. Hence why I mentioned that, you know, to all the men who do the Lord's Supper, to please, you know, let, let us, you know, have time for that re reflection, that self-examination as we're commanded to. Contrast they're giving with Old Testament tithing. The Old Testament required a specific amount, a tithe or 10%, which actually, if you added all the other things, it ended up being about 30%, which could easily be given with minimal effort or thought. But giving in the New Testament is based upon principles requiring careful thought and proper attitudes as one prospered and pur purposed in their heart. You see how it went from a very physical thing to a very more heart thing. Cheerfully, without grudge and obligation, you know, the Old Testament, you know, it required a tithe, 10%. That's it. But in the New Testament, you know, it's not a force. It's not a force, you know. It's, we want to be cheerful without grudging obligation. We want to help out our fellow saints. We want to help out our fellow saints. Contrasts are singing with Old Testament music. Mechanical instruments were used in the Old Testament to accompany praise of, to God. But in the New Testament worship, the instruments they used was the heart, not the harp, upon which they were to make melody, in which they were to sing with grace. Contrast other elements of worship. The Old Testament required a physical tabernacle, Again, physical, physical, you know, physical to me. The separate priesthood, special garments, burning of incense, and elaborate ceremonies and special feast days. Yes, Jeremy. I noticed in your hold the back a couple of slides, you don't have to go back. No, oh. you don't have to, but the thought on it uh -huh. is that it feels like in the Old Testament, it was really a physical, do this, this is this. It's like very regimented. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Right. Many of them knew the stories and knew it, and they could say, "My great grandfather was this." Way. But as time passed, it became less hard. More just follow the rules, get get it done, show up, kill the animal, and be done. Uh huh. And, and God corrected that. Yeah. So like did like a course correction on it, where it's like, okay, no, no, no. It's not just about getting these things done. It's the desire, the will, to want to do it. Yeah. You know, you mentioned giving. Man, not everybody's there. Yeah. But at some point, you start going, you start correcting yourself. And you're like, you know, I need to actually be sacrificing a little bit more than where it is. Yeah. And, and I know God will take care of me in this. I know He's got a plan. Yeah. I know He'll help me. Yeah. And you course correct your life, just like with anything you're doing. You kind of right. Do. But at some point, John, I think that people have gone all heart and no substance. Yeah. Yeah. You got to, yeah. And now you're like, on the other side. Yeah. You both speak your own way. You're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Like, what are you doing? That's right. You've got to be some medium. And I think that through, through the Old Testament, we learn, we learn what the rigidity is. We learn how, how rigid things can be. Yeah. In, in the New Testament, we kind of realize that there's grace. And, and we realize yeah. that there's, there's love. Yeah. We need to have more. And so I think we're, I, we're going through that one. Oh, no. Thanks for your observations, Jeremy. W well said. Well said. Uh, Nick. You had your hand raised? Yeah. Uh, also, mm -hmm. in Old Testament worship, the emphasis was on uh, bringing awe to God. Mm -hmm. That was the temple worship. Yeah. The tabernacle worship, this separate him. He is awesome. And all the, the physical uh, things that were involved in that were part of that. Now, that is not necessary. Yeah. Note the... Uh, the relative barrenness of this facility, as opposed to some of the some of the uh, denominations that still try mm -hmm. to rely on that yeah. separate awesomeness of God and 
everything is physical and yeah. we must see God as awesome. Yeah. Good, good. Very good. Very good. Um, so in the Old Testament, we see these in the Old Testament we require these, these, you know, these physical things, these physical things, right? Then we go to maybe we go in the New Testament, the worship, the temple is the people of God. You know, the people of God. See the change? All Christians are priests. You know, all we're all priests. Isn't that weird to think sometimes that people it blows people's mind? We're all priests. They adorn themselves with Christ. You know, there's no there's no special outfit that we're commanded to wear to be Christians. You know, we've adorned, we have adorned our, ourselves with Christ. And their prayers were as incense. You know, that's what God loves. You know, observance of feast days was a cause of concern. You know, um, uh, the worship in the early church was simple and it was spiritual. I'm talking about the first century church. You know, it was simple. It was spiritual. Certainly simple in contrast with the worship of the Old Covenant. You know, the Old Covenant. Uh, yes, Todd. Oh, no problem. Mm -hmm. So as his worship, he brought what he he wanted. Yeah. You know, and that's what can happen today with worship is people can bring whatever they feel like because their gifts are a certain way. Yeah. They can bring it and put that in worship. Yeah. And, you know, and here we see that you know we follow God's recipe for things. Yeah. And not our own recipe. Yeah. You know, Cain Cain's uh, offering was rejected. You know, it was rejected because, you know, he brought what he thought, you know, but not what God had commanded. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Paul. In contrast to the Old Testament, mm -hmm. where everything had to be like more physical. I, I'm, I'm repeating. It's reiterating, but it's just to know we're in the same group. Yeah. So if you sin, you have to give up a part of your monetary position or otherwise or, or your uh, your lifestyle mm -hmm. or, 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 or stuff like that or, or some of your produce you have to give up on it yeah in the Old Testament no one was offered salvation in the Old Testament mm -hmm. it just it was do it do it do it you mm -hmm. know this way mm -hmm. uh, and, and it strikes me so how some people will want to come back to that system nowadays by salvation by works. Christians not given because to get saved mm -hmm. or by That's their right. way out. That's right. They are already saved and That's they right. are of the sense of gratitude. Yes. And by the way, by the way, this is not limited to money only or possession. Uh -huh. God doesn't want only your possessions. He wants your heart, your yeah, mind, that's right. everything. That's right. Your time, your disposition. If you will have to go through being ridiculed, yeah. be, being, uh, being a, a, a spectacle to the world, people will laugh and, uh, and spit at you. Mm -hmm. That's what we need to carry as well. Yeah. Without that, it's not the whole thing. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, Real Nancy. Quick. Yes. Mm -hmm. We can't rely on a new team. I have two kids mm -hmm. who have had one at church and mm -hmm. the Baptist church. Mm -hmm. And they have a dad and they have one. And I, I, I was so anxious. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't say the verse that was supposed to have one verse that was supposed to be one. Yeah. There was no inward redemption. Mm -hmm. There was no Holy Spirit in the church. Mm -hmm. And I think, and not that, not that they don't respect the Lord. I'm not saying that they mm -hmm. don't respect the Lord. Yeah. <clears throat> but they have to be surrendering lives every day and be fully committed. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Um, all right, continuing on. Um, uh, designed to encourage the worship of God with the inner man, not to make an impression on the outer man, not to say that the outer man was not affected, but the priority is on the spiritual. You know, same thing with here. You know, it's not that we're, you know, that that physically we're not affected because we are, we are. But the, 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 the focus is on the spiritual, on, on the spiritual. And that's what was, that's what's, is what's different going from the old law to the new law. Um, so now we have the church universal. So let's understand the church universal. It's composed of all Christians. And I'm talking about true Christians. Those that believe, confess, repented, and washed away their sins in baptism and continued to walk the Christian walk. That is the church universally. There's just one. You either have believed, confessed, repented, washed away your sins in baptism and continued the, spirit, the, the Christian walk, or you haven't. It's one or the other. You've either you know, become a Christian and you're in the church universal, or you have not become a Christian and you're not. Began on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2 is the start of uh, the New uh, Testament church. You can enter only by being added to the Lord. Acts 2 also, you know, that, that, that the Lord adds you to the church. The Lord adds you to the church once you become a true Christian. The Lord keeps the books on membership. I don't keep the books. You don't keep the book. The Lord keeps the books. It consists of all who are saved. If you are a saved Christian and others believe, confessed, repented, and washed away your sins in baptism and continue to walk the Christian walk, then you are in the church universal. You must be in this to be saved. This is the ark. You have to be in this to be saved. You know, if you're not in the church, which Jesus died for, you know, the bride of Jesus, you know, you must be to be saved. It has no earthly organization. There is no headquarters in Boston. <laughs> you know, there is no headquarters in Boston. It cannot be divided. It can't be. It's, e it's either, it's all people, all people who, who are, are true Christians, and you can't divide that up. You know, you don't say, well, all over here, all the people that have been Christians for less than 10 years, and all these are, you know, the ones from 11 to 20. You know, yeah, no, it's, it can't be divided. And death doesn't affect the membership. You're either saved or you're not saved. Well, if you're saved in this life, then when you die, you're still saved, you know. So death does not affect membership. Contrasting to the church local, right? Composed of Christians in one location. Here we are. <laughs> there are many. We got the uh, Meriden Church of Christ. We got the South Road Church of Christ. We got the Danbury Church of Christ. I don't know. I mean, pointing the right directions. I'm just kind of pointing everywhere. <laughs> you know, but these are congregations. Uh, begins when people join together. At one time, Ken Reimer here. No, he's still in Pennsylvania. At one time, Ken Reimer and the others decided to get together and start a congregation here. You know, began when people would join together. You enter by joining ourselves. You walk in the door. Ali walked in the door. <laughs> Enrolled by human judgment. You know, that, you know, somebody walks in and says, hey, I'd like to start going here. Well, with our human judgment, we're saying, okay, all right, sounds good. You know, uh, the congregation consists of both the saved and the lost. There are people that will be here in worship today that are saved. But there also will be people here in worship today who are not saved. Okay. I like to hopefully think yet, right? They're not saved yet. Um, do not uh, have to be in this to be saved. You can walk in the door, you know? And death does affect the membership. When I die, I'm no longer a member of the Waterbury Church of Christ. <laughs> You know, because I'm not. I'm not here anymore. 
regarding the church universal. The Lord is in the process of building his one true church. Three weeks from to, uh, ago today, uh, Ali, you know, became a Christian. He was baptized right here in this baptistry. The Lord is still in the process of building his one true church, which consists of all the saved. For the Lord adds those being saved to it. Regarding the church local. Once saved, a member of the body of, the, of Christ, the New Testament teaches you should join yourself with a local congregation. You know, it's funny. when I After I did the first Bible class on this uh, three weeks ago, because this is the fourth week, all of a sudden then I sat down for worship, and then, uh, and, and then Van got up and did a sermon about where we're going to go in the next month, and I said, oh, man. He's going to be preaching on the same thing I'm teaching. And so after church, I went to him and I was like, hey, Van, you know, should I change what I'm, I'm teaching? And he said, no, no. He goes, you know, repetition is a beautiful thing. You know, it builds up, you know, uh, good, good learning skills. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's very wise, very wise. You know, well, guess what? You know, the next four weeks we're talking about right there. You know, that's what Van is talking about. That's what we're going to talk about next Sunday when we have the Bible class. That's what we're going to be talking about. But which one? You know, we have to join ourselves, but which one? How can you identify which out of thousands of congregations are considered by the Lord as his faithful churches? Right? You know, <clears throat> what if you want to find the church that Jesus built? Where do you start? I mean, it's overwhelming. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, we're all here. You know what I mean? And sometimes it's just overwhelming when you're not here to think about if you're out there, you know, and you read the Bible, and now you're trying to find the church that Jesus built, you know, it'd be overwhelming. So what do we do? Let's examine what the New Testament reveals about the local church. The name of the local church reveals a lot. Whether the church is concerned about promoting unity in the body of Christ as we're commanded to do. If the name is a denominational name, religious division must not be a major concern for those in the congregation. Denomination is in its very nature divisive and that is unscriptural. The name should therefore be a scriptural name. It should not be the Don Gartman Church. You know, it shouldn't be, you know. Um, reminds me of the time when I, I was in I was in Russia, and we went to um, uh, visit the uh, the church of the spilled blood. So of course I'm thinking, oh, okay, Jesus Christ, you know, his spilled blood on the cross, you know. No, it was dedicated to a politician who had been assassinated on that spot, and it was his spilled blood, you know. <laughs> so um, the name should therefore be a scriptural name, but there is not one scriptural name for the Lord's church in the New Testament. The expressions Church of God, Churches of God, Churches of Christ are commonly used, but other, time, other uh, terms include um, uh, God in Christ, Body of Christ, Kingdom of God, Bride of Christ, Temple of God, etc. But the use of scriptural names instead of humanly conceived names reflects a desire to follow scriptures and not human tradition, you know, Church of the Spilled Blood. Um, it, can, it conveys a desire to honor God in Christ and not some man, creed, or, pop, or particular doctrine, or even nowadays popular doctrines that are out there. However, the name alone is not a sure guide. I mean, let's be honest. A Muslim church could put on their building Church of Christ. It's a free country. They got First Amendment rights. They could do it. You know, we, we, we can't stop them. We wouldn't stop them, you know. But the name alone doesn't mean that they're faithful. There are maybe many congregations that bear the name of Christ or God that may not be truly honoring them. For example, there are over 200 separate denominations that use the name Church of God. Likewise, there may be Churches of Christ that are not faithful, you know? They are fallen congregations, you know? 
So you can't go by the name alone, you know, but yet, yet, I would still recommend that one begins their search with the name Church of Christ because your odds are, are great of finding a faithful church. Yes. So, like, in the, in the past couple of slides, it's going through, it's like, I, I see a, I'm going to use the word contradiction, it's actually the same word, frequent. Okay. So you say, Church of Christ, yeah. it's not a denomination. Yes. I would argue that many would look at it as a Same denomination. Day. Yes, you don't say words and walks and things like that. Yeah. But when you say Church of Christ, mm -hmm. while there are going to be differences in those congregations, yeah. often you kind of know what you're getting. Yeah. It's not all. Yeah. But at the same time, by using that word Church of Christ and, and going by what you were saying, you also separate yourself yes. from other people too. And yeah. so there are churches that are scriptural that don't have Church of Christ in their name. Yeah. There are churches that aren't scriptural that have Church of Christ in their name. That is correct. So when we think about like even here in Waterbury, right? We say we're the Church of Christ. Mm -hmm. That is a you know, that's an age to a lot of people. It's code. Yeah. Or, you know, typically when you walk in the Church of Christ, you're gonna see certain things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not that you wouldn't see those things in other churches that don't say Church of Christ either. Yeah. How do you balance that where Church of Christ kind of identifies who we are, yeah. but Church of Christ and putting a name on it uh, eventually creates a denomination? Yeah, and that's a very good question. Very good question. So, um, and we've got five minutes left in class. Five minutes. So, uh, uh, Paul, I won't be able to get to you. Sorry. So, so uh, a lot of times uh, I'm on a Facebook uh, group page of a lot of Church of Christ ministers and elders, and sometimes the discussion will come up. You know, we've been thinking about changing our name to whatever. You know, do you think we should do it or not? And I would say almost every single time, without fail, they end up deciding not to. And the reason is, is because think about it. If we're on vacation, wherever it might be, France, it doesn't matter. Germany, California, it doesn't matter. When you go to look for a church to go worship at, what do you tend to type in the GPS? Church of Christ. You know what I mean? Because like you said, um, our odds are great that we know what to expect. Now, we could walk in. That's where we got to do our due diligence and look at their website. We could walk in and they're not faithful at all. They're not faithful in any way, shape, or form, you know. But our odds are very good that we're going to walk in, you know, uh, knowing exactly, you know, what to expect. Just, you know, for example, as I went on vacation with my family growing up, one time we walked into a, a congregation that was not faithful. That was before the Internet. I know I'm aging myself, but that happens every day, right? So, so the thing is, is that, you know, we walked, and they were not faithful. But except for that one time, Every time we walked in, except for that, no matter where we were, it was always a faithful congregation. Todd. The church is the first franchise that you get. Mm. If you're looking for a to eat at McDonald's, you got to look for the Golden Arches. <laughs> yeah. You can't, if you're going to look for something else, you're going to get something. Yeah. But if you want something that's scriptural, which is what the Church of Christ, you know, the, the Bible says, yeah. Yeah, excellent. All right, we just got a few minutes. We only got a few more stills, so hopefully this times out perfectly. Um, we need to, if you're looking for a congregation, you know, if you're looking for the church that Jesus built, examine the gospel being preached. Ali and I talked about this yesterday. Are they teaching the people how God says, not how we say, how to be saved, believe, confess, repent, wash away sins in baptism, continue to walk the Christian walk, or by a man-made invention? Sinner's prayer, altar call, or you name it. The, car, the, the church that was closest to my grandparents growing up, they used to take a rose petal, dip it in water, and throw it and hit it the person in the face. And that signified that they were saved. I don't know where they got that from, but that's what they did. You know, so 
you know so when you're looking for the lord's church hey are they examining are they are they teaching how to be saved the way the god's word says we need to be saved and not man-made inventions and we all know right now you know man-made inventions are the way that most people are going to uh, churches that have man-made inventions on how to be saved if the gospel proclaimed proclaimed by those in the local church is different by changing either facts or commands of the gospel then people then the people are not being saved and the lord is not adding them to his church that's a very important line do we understand that that if somebody is going to a church that's not teaching how to be saved the way god tells us how to be saved then those people there they could be the nicest coolest people in the world but that doesn't change the fact they're not being saved and the lord is not adding them to his church a church with a perverted gospel may have the nicest people but they're still unregenerative people Compare the practice with the New Testament pattern. So if you're walking into a congregation in the New Testament, we find a pattern regarding local congregations, just like the patterns discussed in the earlier class. Noah in his pattern for the ark. There's a pattern for the New Testament church. The New Testament describes the early church during its first 60 years. 60 years. A careful study of Acts and the epistles reveal a picture of this church. From this picture, a pattern emerges in reference to the worship of local churches. We can see how they worshiped. The work of the local churches, we can see how they worked. The organization of the churches. This pattern emerges as we see the early Christians continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine being taught the same things in every church. Now, sometimes you'll see people, they'll say, well, that was just there at that time. Well, that's not what it says. It says they taught the same thing in every church for all times. Faithful churches abiding in the uh, apostles' doctrine will reflect this pattern today. Their worship will be like that described in the New Testament. Their work as a congregation will be similar to that found in the New Testament. The organization as a congregation will seek to be like that described in the New Testament, New Testament church. We here at the Waterbury Church of Christ must continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine by continuing to teach the way God says we become saved, by continuing to keep our worship scriptural, by keeping our worship decently and in order as commanded by God, by continuing to keep our worship scriptural, by keeping unauthorized practices out of our worship, for example, instruments in worship, or adding and taking away from the Lord's Supper, which we see sometimes nowadays. By, uh, yes? Huh? Huh? Yeah, we use our, our voice. Yeah, so so that um, I can um, we can have a Bible class on that later, but that comes down to aid or necessity. You know, is it an aid or is it an addition? You know, is it an aid? Oh, that's not true either. Um, that is a new modern um, uh, definition of it, but that's not the one that was at the time of the writing of scriptures. The priest says, the priest says it, it's yeah. Thing to the of the yeah. No, that that that's a that's a new that's a new definition for it. And when I say new, I'm talking 1500s. That's a new definition as of like 1500s. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Some of my favorite Christian songs were being uh -huh. through that whole video. Yeah. In any Yeah. If instruments are a sin in worship, then how do we get away with that? Uh huh. Well, it wasn't in worship. 
if it had been in worship, if it had been in worship, trust me, we would have uh, gone out. I think everybody would have gone and talked to the elders. <laughs> yeah, no, it was after worship. Our worship had concluded, and then we showed it. You know, our worship had concluded, then we showed it. And, uh, and like I said, you know, a, a pitch pipe is, is just, it's just an aid. It's just like we can have song books. We can have air conditioning. We can come in cars, you know, and that is, there's a difference between having a, um, an aid or adding, you know, an addition, you know, see? So, uh, you know, as, as one of the, as John Calvin said, you know, at least the pitch pipe has, I think it's John Calvin, had, you know, at least the pitch pipe has a good common sense to shut up when it's time to sing, you know? <laughs> You know, but that again, that's going to a deep class, which I'll be glad to do next. If the elders want, that would be no problem at all. Uh, everything that uh, or I can uh, be I'll be glad to send you um, articles I have. Or books, uh, we need to hold our elders and shepherds accountable, as I just actually mentioned, you know, if something was done in, you know, if if they had had instruments in worship, I think all of us would have gone to the elders after church. We'd have held them accountable in our last slide and we are done. Uh, he, the elders, must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So we need to make sure we hold uh, our elders. Uh, and they must hold themselves accountable. Yes, Paul. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, on the thing, like, when, it, when, it, when you're looking for a church of Christ, I, I would think of myself. It would be good if you look for Church of Christ and you don't have to be in a Mormon church because they use Church of Christ as a part of the name. Yeah, school. Church Christ. And by the way, by the way what, I, what I want to say is a lot of denominations, they baptize right. Uh -huh. And the king enters into the kingdom through baptism just like we do. Yeah. But is there teaching of the church like Mormon, yeah. SDA, Jehovah's Witnesses, and other uh, denominations? They baptize right. Mm. But is there teaching? So, what is a judge? A Bible is our only judge, and we mm. should study it always, like Bereans in Acts uh, 17. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, that concludes this uh, class. Remember, next uh, next Sunday we start that small group classes, the small group classes. So I hope to see all you all here, uh, and plus hopefully many, many more. And uh, we'll see where it takes us. So hopefully you. Uh, you learned something from this uh, class. Um, I enjoyed giving it. Hopefully you all enjoyed listening to it. All right. Uh, have a great day, and uh, may our worship be pleasing in God's sight.